Uh, what do you do with unhappy people? Most of us don't like to be around unhappy people. I don't care who they are. We, uh, we have an aversion to unhappy people. We're afraid they're going to make us unhappy. And uh, I want to talk tonight about one of the reasons that people are so unhappy, and that's because they search for happiness in the wrong place. Uh, you remember that little song, I think it was Johnny Lee who sang it, Looking for Love and All the What? All the yeah, y'all listen to country music, don't you? Yeah. Uh, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, uh, oddly enough, a lot of people look for happiness in a lot of wrong places as well. And one of them is um, they're fearful. They are driven by fear. Now, I'm not talking about people that uh, get a little anxious every now and then. But I'm talking about people that are really driven by fear. And we live in a world today that is so driven and moved by what we call fear. They are literally afraid to get out of the house. They're afraid to do anything. They're afraid at night when they go to bed. They watch television. They're spooked. Everything is bad. You know, you think, oh, my goodness. This lady just heard that coronavirus affects people that are 65 and over. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people get troubled by a lot of things. Almost everyone is controlled by fear, and a lot of times they don't even know they are. They don't even realize that they're really being controlled by fear. Let me ask you tonight, what controls you? Does God really control your life? Stop and think about it. Are you controlled by fear. You know, I spent uh, a lot of time yesterday. I know Dwight Dale had done the same thing in calling people that are not coming uh, to worship on Sunday morning even. And a lot of people are just so driven by fear. I mean, I wish you could have heard uh, the conversations uh, that uh, I had with some of these people. It, it amazes me. Uh, I was talking with an employer yesterday here in Palestine and uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, the personnel director told me that these people that come in and apply for a job and I said, we always ask them, one of the first questions is, is uh, do you have COVID-19 or have you had it? And a lot of times they say they have had it. And then the next question is, where did you get it? And you know what? He said, you're not going to believe this. But he said, do you happen to have any idea where most people say they got it? Hmm? Nope. They got it at, church. at church. At church. And I said, well, my goodness, that's amazing. We don't have anybody that has it or has had it. I said, it's amazing. And he said, well, wait a minute. Let me back up. He said they put that on their application. And he says, it sounds a little bit more respectable than saying I got it at the bar <laughs> or at the club. You know, I mean, the personnel director says, oh, you got it at church? Oh, my goodness. Boy, you sound like the kind of person we need working for us, you know. But people are often controlled by it. Fear has two meanings. If you look up here, one of them is, is forget everything and run, and the other is face everything and rise where you are. And we have a choice every day when we get out of bed, whether we're going to live by fear or whether we're going to live by faith. It is true that fear does not prevent death, but it prevents life. I don't know how people live like that every day. I mean, they're so afraid that they're going to, you know, make a wrong move, and, and, you know, everything is bad. We live in dangerous times. You see all these headlines just like I do. COVID-19, uh, they said today on, on the news, I well, it came across my cell phone there a minute ago, that they had the largest number of deaths in Texas today, set a record. But they were saying the people that are being tested, it's going down, and the positivity rate is going down from those who are being tested also. And, uh, you know, we could be very, uh, I mean, negative about it. Uh, what about all, here's another headline, what about all these uh, anarchists, I call them antichrist, <laughs> that are, are running rampant and are looting and robbing and, and 
busting in windows and destroying businesses that people have worked a lifetime to achieve. It's a bad, bad thing. But they roam the streets. And listen to this. Believe it or not, the criminalization of Christianity is here. One of the things that these Antipa is saying now they're going to start doing is burning down white churches. That's what they're planning to do. We don't live on Fantasy Island, a lot of us, and when I talk about people that are fear, I understand there's a, there's a wholesome fear, but there's an unwholesome fear also. And the one that I'm talking about tonight is the unwholesome fear. Uh, you know, the word fear is not a bad word. The Bible says that we're to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Solomon said that a long time ago, and it's a Hebrew word. It means to honor, to respect. But when we talk about fear in the sense that it becomes apprehension or anxiety, hey, that's a bad thing, isn't it? But some people want to live on fantasy island and have this fantasy that everything in life is going great. Hey, you know what? You're not Superman. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, life is real and bad things happen in our world. And we have to make a choice every day whether we're going to search for our happiness as a result of our fear or as a result of our courage. I've had people even tell me, well, the reason I'm so fearful is the fact that I want to think the worst and then if good happens, then I feel good. But if I think that good's going to happen and it doesn't happen, then I feel so bad and down and dejected and, and depressed. What a horrible, horrible feeling that must be. Let me share some thoughts with you quickly tonight on this idea of fear because it really is a habit that people get into. People are taught that when they're young to be afraid. How many of you were taught when you were young not to speak to strangers? How many of you, anybody here not taught to speak to strangers? Some of you, okay. Okay. I talk to strangers. <laughs> Probably I talk too much. <laughs> but fear is a negative thought process that is often on co-pilot, you know, listen, or autopilot. You don't have to tell yourself to be fearful. It just comes by nature because that's the way you live. You were brought up that way. How many of you were ever afraid of the dark? Many people are. Many people are afraid of the dark, nightfall. Uh, you know, many of our fears are based on the unknown. What might happen? What could happen? And it cripples. It really does the way that we live. It destroys any, any vestige of happiness that we have in life because we go through life and we're so troubled by, you know, maybe you heard something about someone else, uh, you know, a uh, People sometimes find themselves on ventilators. Uh, matter of fact, I was talking to someone earlier about someone that uh, has been on a ventilator because of COVID-19. But I just got off the phone with Gene Greer, who tested, and he's a preacher now at Elkhart, and he tested positive for COVID-19 just about two weeks ago. And he says, I've never had a symptom one. He said, I've been quarantined. But he said, I don't have anything. He said, I'm not running a fever. I don't have a cough. He said, it's not hard for me to breathe. I don't have any kind of intestinal problem. You know, and, uh, and yet we, we feel like that's a death knell if it ever, ever happens. Could it kill you? Sure it could. I'm not saying it doesn't kill you. But sometimes I think it's overemphasized. You can do it what is right and not be so fearful. Um. Uh, it is born of ignorance. Fear is. And it is the parent of anger and hate. What would you do? Stop and think about all the things you could do in life if you weren't afraid. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic. You know, a lot of people are afraid to talk to other people about God and about matters religious. I don't know why people, why do you think people are, are afraid to do that? Anybody want to? comment on that one? Why do you think people are afraid to talk to other people about Jesus? And I'm going to tell you something. It really is a fear that a lot of people have in life. Marty? Rejection, confrontation. 
They're afraid of confrontation with someone about it. All right. Uh, Daniel? Daniel? All right. That they won't listen to what you're saying, Andrew? But Christians, sometimes we get afraid that we don't know about, enough about the stuff he's talking about. We don't set those questions. All right. Yeah. We're afraid maybe they might come back with a question or maybe something that we couldn't answer. And, you know, uh, I always carry Audrey with me. We do that. If they ask me that, I say, well, I might not be able to tell you, but my wife can. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, we, we all have issues with a lot of things. People are afraid of getting out in their automobile. People are afraid of going to Walmart today because of the coronavirus, you know. Uh, all, all kinds of issues, fears that people have. People are claustrophobic. I was talking with a woman over in Louisiana yesterday, and, and uh, she was talking about uh, the respirator, and she said, I told him, boy, if I get sick enough to have to go on a respirator, let me go. Let the Lord have me. I'm not going to do it. I can't handle that. I'm... I'm claustrophobic. Fears. So many of them. But we know that down deep inside our life, on, on the other side, as I've said up here, of fear is freedom. And that's what we really seek, isn't it? I mean, freedom is the thing that makes us happy, isn't it? It's not being bound. You know what? When you are abnormally fearful, you are in chains. You really are. You may not be bound by literal chains, but you are figuratively bound by chains. But you have the key to move off of fear. But you have to connect with God. All the psychologists telling you, well, you just shouldn't be fearful. All the sermons that I preach and say, and I tell you, I say, well, you know, don't, don't be given to fear. You know, get rid of fear and and, you know, just don't let live in your heart. And, you know, fear and faith can't live in the same life, you know. But you know what you really have to do is connect with God. And when you form a connection with God, you will eventually get over your apprehension and your fears. You will. It is a proven fact. We all have coaches in life. God's my coach. Who's your coach? Who coaches you in life? Is it God? Or is it Satan? I'm thankful that when we offer a prayer, it goes up to God. I'm, I'm going to tell you something tonight. You know, I've had a lot of people say, you know, well, all we can do about it now is pray. Or if it's a last resort sort of thing, uh, they don't really believe that praying to God is going to change anything. Uh, I've, I've been praying about this coronavirus. How many of you have been praying about it for our nation? I mean, really praying about it over and over and over again. You know, you don't just go to God one time. Remember the, remember the parable that Jesus told about the woman that went before the judge continually and the judge finally relented because she continued to go before him with her pleading? I think sometimes we have to let God know how much we really, really want it. You know, kids do that with us, don't they? I say, oh, please, Mama, please, Daddy, you know, please, 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 you know. How many times we go before God and plead with him for our prayers to be answered? Fear drives people, and it not only disconnects us from God, it, it disconnects us from one another. I don't like to be around people that are fearful. You know, television can make you fearful. You turn it on and you watch a steady diet of that, I'm going to tell you something. And like I said, they don't just give you the news anymore. Where it's about five minutes of the news and the rest of it's all commentary and what Joe Blow think about it and his opinion is about as good as yours or the next man's or mine or who's ever. And, but it will disconnect us from one another. The Bible uses that little expression, fear not, over and over and over again. Not just regarding the provisions of life. David said, I've been young, I've been old, never seen the righteous forsaken, or God's people begging bread. He always supplied our need. He provided for us. You know what the word provide means? 
It's a word that really comes from the Greek language. It's like pro-video, like pre-scene. When you say provide, you're saying it is pre-visioned. God knows what we have need of, James says, before we even ask. That's what the word provide really means, and he does provide for us every day of our life. But secondly, do not be afraid. Because God is greater than anything that man can do to you. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis chapter 18, the question is asked in verse 14, is there anything too hard for God? No. John said, greater is he that is within you than he that's in the world. God is great. You know, we sing all those great songs, don't we? Like, our God is alive and how great thou art. And, boy, we can pump it out. But do we really, down deep inside, believe it? When I think of all these people, oh man, Audrey and I were talking yesterday afternoon. I'll be honest with you. I'm afraid that some of the brethren that at one time were very faithful, won't be back. And it's like the sign says, and I said it Sunday, you continue to miss church, and it won't be long before you won't miss it. And I said to someone, I said, well, how safe would we have to have it for you to come? I don't know. Well, what kind of answer is that? I'm not saying you don't take precaution. We all do. Dale and I have talked about it. Dwight and I have talked about it numerous times. Trying to think of ways to let people know that we have things safe. But Audrey and I were talking about it this afternoon. You know, she said, here's the way I look at it. If I go to worship God and I get... COVID-19 at church then it may be God's way of letting me know he's ready to call me home Amen. and I'm going to tell you something <laughs> I'd rather get it at church than anywhere <laughs> Daniel didn't you last night say that God's bigger than anything man can do to us absolutely God be for us. Who can be against us? First John 4, 4. Year of God, little children, and have overcome the world. Listen to this. Because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. That's why Satan didn't control me. God controlled me. And there's that Coach again, who controls you, God or Satan? It is God who gives me strength, God's servant said in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and 33. He gives me strength and he keeps my way secure. It's hard for me to believe that if I'm coming to worship God, and I'm here to worship God, that God would, let me tell you something, death and disease is not of God, it is of Satan, and you can go back and you can trace it all the way back in the annals of history to the dawn of creation, you can, because death is of the devil, Dan. When you were younger, and, and it is true, we, in some ways they were sheltered 
from a lot, and there's a big difference between shel being sheltered from some things. You protect your kids like God protects us. It's like that scripture says right there. He arms us with strength, and he makes my way secure. There's a difference between being sheltered and being fearful. Uh, you know, there's a song we sing sometimes called Sheltered in the Arms of God. Another one is Safe in the Arms of Jesus. I'm going to tell you, folks, always talk to my kids. When you get behind the wheel of a car, you make sure that you keep your eyes on the road. <coughs> keep your eyes on the road. Important to do that. That's not to make you fearful, but it's to help you understand, hey, this can keep something from happening. You're in control. God's in control. You know, if, if you take drugs into your body, and I say, look, you need to be wary of who you run with also because they can have an effect on your life. Now, and there are some people, Dana likes you to think that, boy, she didn't do anything she was a kid. <laughs> she may have lived a sheltered life, but I'm going to tell you something. I'll never forget the night that she and Amanda both wrapped one of the deacon's yards. I thought I was out of here. <laughs> well, they probably didn't do it by themselves. Uh, you, you have to be careful. I understand that. And not make your kids so overly afraid but nurture them along and help them understand the dangers that lie ahead in life, whatever it happens to be. And there are dangers out there. God, you know, that's what the Bible really is about. It warns us of dangers that lie before us. And so that's why we warn our children. It's not really to make them so fearful, uh, but to help them understand there's a right way and a wrong way. Do I? There's a big difference in being fearful and being watchful. Um, this coronavirus. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're fearful, you never get out of your house. Yeah. You sit there, you have groceries delivered, you never leave. But if, if you are proactive with it, you do go, but you take precautions. Right. And that's not being fearful. That's a good point. Being watchful but not fearful, and, and that, that's a bit. There's a big difference. That's a very, very good thought, Dwight. I appreciate it. God is greater, and uh, when you read the book, book of Ephesians, chapter four, Paul says that, uh, and it, and it's something that we should remember that God will take care of us. Uh, I trust in God. I do trust in Him, and when there is a lack of trust on our part, then it makes us unhappy. But not only are we unhappy, we make other people around us unhappy. Nahum chapter 1, God knows us. He protects us. For the Lord is good, a stronghold. Listen to what he says. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. God knows whether you're trusting in him tonight. God knows whether you're fearful or whether you're watchful. Will you move with caution in life? God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we know about ourselves. You can go to the book of 1 John chapter 3.20 for that one. God knows us so well. Virginia? Day, I don't sin. I'm like, I'm going to make sure he did. Yeah. 
You know, I've heard of people being afraid of water, and that's why they're not baptized. I mean, I've heard of people, you know, being afraid of water. Uh, and I think they call it aqua phobia, I think it is. And uh, that, that's a bad, bad fear also. But it's something we have to put behind us. For he will command his angel, and I love this passage in Psalm chapter 9, 91, rather, in verse 11. He will give charge to his angels concerning you, and he will guard you in all of your ways. And you don't have to be afraid of tomorrow because God's already there. Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, he's not governed by time. God takes care of tomorrow right now. He don't wait till tomorrow. You know, I've told you before that the church was not an afterthought with God. People ask me sometimes in personal Bible study, do you think God knew man was going to sin? What do you think? Yeah. Sure he knew. Because the Bible says in Revelation 1 that Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He wasn't slain then, but he wasn't in prospect. Slain from the foundation of the world. Andrew? Well, if, if man had never sinned, then Jesus would be pretty much irrelevant. He wouldn't have to come and die on the cross. That's right. Absolutely. God knew man was going to sin, and the church was not an afterthought with God. It was, hey, there from the very beginning. God knows everything. If he is an omniscient God... He had to know that mankind was going to sin. And when I think about tomorrow, God's already there. You know what? I pray every night, and I pray, God, help us. Keep us safe through the night if it be in your will, and bless us that we might see that new day arise. And if we don't, God's going to take me home. I'm not worried about it. It's not something I lay in fear and apprehension about. I told somebody one time that, it is a proven fact statistically that more people die at 3 o'clock in the morning. Did you know that? I'm almost a little apprehensive about telling you that because I preached that in a sermon one time and more people came to church. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they told me that night, they said, I'm just so afraid to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> you know? I mean, 3 o'clock in the morning, what could happen to me? You know, Some of them even set their alarm for 259. They wanted to make sure that they were awake when it happened. Daniel? I may have missed that, but you're talking about people dying at 3 o'clock in the morning. Ain't that the way to go in the spring? Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to go. That's the way to go? Okay, Ben? Timothy 1 verse 7 says that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of love and a sound mind. And I, I don't think it's by accident that he says that when he says God gives us a sound mind and that's the very opposite of a mind that is fearful. We do, Ben, you're exactly right. But, but I think that in, in life we have to be people that are fearful of God. Fear God in that sense. Respect God. 
And that's what Solomon meant, by the way, when he said to fear God and keep his commandments. It was to show God respect, hold him in a reverential awe. And if we, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, the reason I became a Christian is I was so afraid of going to hell. I became a Christian because I love God. And doesn't the Holy Scripture say that true love casteth out all fear? What we need to do is conquer our fears. And if God is for us, Romans 8 and verse 28, favorite passage, if God is for us, who can be against us? I guess the message of the Bible is don't be afraid. It will, it will destroy your joy and your happiness. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, God really wants me to be happy. And I, I think he does want us to be happy. I think he wants us to be joyful. But when we choose to be fearful, then we say goodbye to happiness and we say goodbye to joy. But there's a third thought. God cares about the tiny details. You know, sometimes we forget that. There are just so many little details that God is concerned about little details have you ever thought about that when you read the scripture sometimes God says certain things about certain things I mean uh, you know Jesus was sold <laughs> into the hands of those who would crucify him 30 pieces of silver why did God include that little detail why do we have to know that there was a reason for it uh, little details one thing we have to do in life is remember that God knows what he's doing God you know we always say that we, we, we say God is in control he isn't he is control he can have control over everything in the world but he may not be in control of your life you may still be being uh, as one who's trying to run it yourself or you're being controlled by demonic forces. David said in Psalms 139 and verse 13, for you created, listen to this, this is significant, folks. When you, you know, all these people believe in abortion, I want you to listen to this passage. For you created my inmost being, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. You were you in your mother's womb. <laughs> you weren't a blob of protoplasm. You were knit, being knit together by God. Don't allow a small problem to get in the way of a big God. I tell people all the time, sometimes when they come to me, they're apprehensive, they're fearful, and I say, look, you know, just turn it over to God. Turn it over to the Lord, you know. Sunday morning, my sermon is on... How many of you have ever been driving down the highway and listening to your GPS or maybe your phone and it says, recalibrate, recalibrate, you know? <laughs> I think it used to drive Bob crazy. We'd be going off somewhere to a gospel meeting and Bob would go with me and, and uh, Siri would come on and, and he'd say, I think you're on the wrong road. I said, really? He said, yeah, listen to her. Recalibrate, recalibrate, you know, turn around at your earliest convenient. Please make a U-turn, you know? That's my sermon Sunday morning is recalibrating. And one of the things we have to recalibrate is our time. <coughs> Sometimes we all get off on the wrong road. And we're afraid sometimes. We are fearful because we don't think that God can handle it. He can. Even death itself is in the hands of God. If you're a Christian, you're not going to die until your appointed time. Now, I'm not to say here tonight that you can't hasten your death, but the Bible says we have an appointed time. The days of our years are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score, 80 years, 
Yet there is strength, labor, and there's sorrow, and we're soon cut off and we fly away. But Jesus says, you know, our days are numbered. They are. And I'm convinced that they are. And we can go out, you can go out and commit suicide, hang yourself, step out on the highway in front of a car, oncoming car. You know what? Yeah. You can be hurled into the vastness of eternity pretty quick. But God has an appointed time for you. I know that Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says it is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. Henry, did you start to say something? Yeah, I just, I just want to say that, you know, even though we don't need to be fearful, we can make preparation. Sure. Uh, and, and Mark, you know, Mark chapter 11, verse 1, Mark chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, And when he had said these things, he was taken up, and Well, sure. Be, be prepared for things that are going to come. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and I, I think you're exactly right. And I think a lot of times in life, one of the things that cause us, causes us greater fear is because we have not made preparation. You know, uh, you know, people are always talking about, and, uh, you know, I mean, the news media can say some of the silliest, stupidest things. I think it was yesterday they were saying, well, you know, they were real concerned now because if Donald Trump doesn't get elected, will he leave office? You know, just stupid stuff. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but anyway, I'll get off the politics issue of it. But uh, it, it's amazing, the news media, what they say. They try to create fear in you. All this thing of defunding the police, what does that do to people when they say defund the police? De huh? Henry? You know, the, the thing about defunding the police, who is that going to hurt the most? It's going to hurt the most those the people that are wanting it. With, because the, the people that have things that are rich are going to be able to buy their own protection. Absolutely. So Yeah. <laughs> if, if you're defunding the police, you're taking protection away from those that need it the most. That well, they do. At least afford to, to take care of it themselves. Yeah. And, and, and really, that's an unfortunate thing. And that particular, those particular people prey on the mentality of those who don't have a whole lot going up here. I, I hate to say that, but that's honest God truth. Anybody with any gumption or any sense at all would not want to do away with the police. And in some cases, they, they didn't just defund them. What they were talking about, what they talk about defunding them, is actually cutting the budget for police. Not totally, but just cutting it and, uh, you know, distributing it somewhere else. But there are some cities like Milwaukee where all the riots and all this stuff is going on. They want to eliminate the police, and they want to start over. Well, it didn't work so well for CHOP, did it, out in Seattle? Andrew? Yeah, uh, I work out in prison, and I do a lot of, I love, I do a lot of interviews with, with these incarcerated individuals. One of the questions that I ask in those interviews is, how do you feel about the whole civil system? How do you feel about having a legal system? And before all this hit, of course, they get a lot of guys that are very jaded, toward it because, you know, they portray themselves as victims of it. Now the answers are starting to change a whole lot more. Oh, thank God we have them. You know, because they, they're afraid of when they get out, what they're getting out. Yeah. And then what really creates an abnormal fear for you is when the authorities arrest you when you're trying to protect your own property, like the couple here the other day. You remember that? I want to go back to the America that we once knew. I don't know about the rest of you. But there it is again. Who's coaching you? God or Satan? Lay your soul upon the solid rock of God's eternal, there's that word again, provide providence. Taking care of you, 
knows your need before you even ask. The fears we don't face become our limits. They limit you. You know, you hear me say this all the time, that God meets our needs in life, and he does. The Hebrew writer said that, that all of our needs are met in Christ Jesus our Lord. But how does God meet our deepest needs? He knows us. And because he knows us, he knows how to supply those needs. You know, uh, all of us have a job. I mean, we're, we work. We, we got some stuff going on in Washington right now about whether or not uh, you give more money than what people earn at their job. Well, how many people are going to stay home and not go to work? Hmm? Most of them would if they're going to stay home. 1 Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord. There's a Hebrew word now, and I told you it meant respect. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart. You can either love or you can fear one or the other in life. That's what it boils down to. If you love God, you're not going to fear. But if you fear, you don't love God. Because true love casteth out all fear. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their inheritance will be forever. Psalms 37 and verse 18. Better to lose your life than your soul. Think about that one a minute. All these people say, well, I can't come worship God. Might die. Are we going to say to God, you know, God... I know you died on a cross for me, but I'm not willing to die for you. Can you actually look into the face of God and say that? The Bible says, fear not him that destroys the body. I think Ben was alluding to that some of it a while ago. But fear him that destroys both body and soul in hell we ought to say to the world and when we're tempted my soul is not for sale <coughs> don't let fear cause you to lose your soul in hell Revelation 21 and verse 8 defines who's going there by the way and one of them is if you go back and read this passage the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth of fire and brimstone. The more you learn to trust in God, the happier you will be, and the less fearful you will become. It is a habit, but it's like a lot of other things, traps that we fall into sometimes. Uh, we have to eliminate all the negative vibes and get rid of them. And you can do it, as I've mentioned here, with just two simple resolves. Number one, I can and I will. You stop and think about this just a minute, too. And uh, Audrey and I have had some very theological discussions at times. I, you know, we were saying yesterday, sometimes people that say, well, I can't come because of this. And, you know, what if God suddenly took away? I've heard people say, well, I can't, I can't come because of my kid. What if God suddenly took away the thing that hindered you from worshiping God? Something to think about. And as we said last week, if you live in the past and your fear and your happiness is being driven by fear and the way you live your life, you know, I've heard people say, well, the reason I'm so fearful today is what happened last week. Well, that don't mean it's going to happen this week, does it? But you will eventually fall apart. And that's our lesson tonight.